everybody, Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, and welcome back to our continuing coverage of the Remembrance Day uh, Parade here and the ceremonies that will take place here in Gettysburg in 2022. I'm down in and along Carlisle Street here in Gettysburg, but we're going to walk and talk. We're going to make our way up towards where the parade is going to take place. We'll be showing that on our YouTube channel around 1 o'clock this afternoon, uh, and that's Eastern Time, so you'll be able to check that out on the American Battlefield Trust YouTube channel. And uh, while we're down here, what we want to do is talk a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this is known as a Remembrance Day. It's also called Dedication Day because dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery here at Gettysburg. Remembrance Day is the parade that's put on by the Sons of Union veterans here. And this is, I believe, the 66th annual parade that you'll see later today. Uh, but. We're standing down here at the uh, what some people call the Lincoln train station. This is the Gettysburg train station. Today it's run by the Gettysburg Foundation. You can come down here and uh, take part in their virtual reality experience that they have. It's really cool. There are friends at the Gettysburg Foundation, so do check that out. Um, but this train station was completed in May of 1859. The tracks that run through here would have gone off toward Hanover and Hanover Junction. Those would have been completed in December of 1858. So this area is a bustling community by 1863. We have 2,400 or so residents. About 8% of those are African-American. We have more than 400 structures from uh, at the time of the war, including about six churches. We have a telegraph line. Uh, we have gaslit streets. We have all kinds of things going on here in Gettysburg. This is a growing community. And of those 400 or so original buildings, we have about 200 of them uh, still standing here in and around Gettysburg from the time of the American Civil War. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to kick it over to Sarah Byerly. Sarah's on our education team here at the Trust. She's going to talk a little bit about uh, Abraham Lincoln, his arrival here in Gettysburg. And we're going to walk and talk our way up towards the diamond, the square, the circle, whatever you want to call it, the downtown of Gettysburg. Sarah. Thanks, Chris. And thank you to our viewers who are joining us, um, watching this live or watching the recording later. As Chris said, we are here at the Gettysburg train station and we're going to start walking. So follow me. Um, we're going to avoid tripping as much as possible. Here we go. Um, so Abraham Lincoln was invited to come and make a few short remarks, a few appropriate remarks at the dedication of Gettysburg National Cemetery. And um, he sets aside time out of his schedule to come here. And he's actually going to arrive on November 18th, 1863. So the day before the dedication event, he'd arrive at that train station there. He travels with other politicians, with members of his political staff. And he's coming here with great intention. He wants to see this place where this great battle was fought on northern soil. But he also knows that he has an opportunity to make some statements about what's going on in the war and things like that. And keep in mind the setting, the context. Not only are we after the Battle of Gettysburg, but think about what's coming up. What's coming up politically in 1864? The presidential election. And all right, we're going to cross the street here. So Lincoln is starting to set that groundwork for his run for re-election. So keep that in mind as we're looking at the Gettysburg Address and what it lays out. Think about that larger context. Um, because he recognizes the speech is going to be heard by many people. It may be picked up by the newspapers. So it's an opportunity to say something about the war, about what's happening, about his hopes for what's going to be defining the United States moving forward or as they uh, work to reunify the country. So now we are here on uh, Lincoln Square, which is also kind of Lincoln Circle. Um, lots of traffic here today. Um, you may hear some of the period music. I think it stopped at the moment, but it is happening in the background. So we're here on the square. Chris, do you want to point out some of the buildings as we continue our journey? Yeah, so to orient you here in Gettysburg, we're actually coming from the north into what is called at the time the diamond. In fact, it's a large area here behind us today, which is a roundabout. That roundabout inside of it in 1859 would have been the Adams County Courthouse. It sat there from 1804 to 1859 when the new Adams County Courthouse, which was uh, created on Baltimore Street, which you can see the cupola of it and the clock tower down there. So we would come down from Carlisle Street. Carlisle's to the north of us. You might know that from Jeb Stewart's ride around the Union Army that didn't go very well here at Gettysburg. That will take you up to the 11th Corps line on the Gettysburg Plain. 
Off to my right, you'll see a large red brick building. That is a David Wills house. David Wills is a Gettysburg native. He is a lawyer here. He's a graduate of Pennsylvania College, today Gettysburg College in 1851. And he and his uh, wife, Catherine, live inside of that house. Catherine is eight months pregnant at the time of November of 1863. And that is where Abraham Lincoln, amongst others, will stay uh, during their time here at Gettysburg. Edward Everett will be there. The governor of Pennsylvania, Andrew Curtin, will supposed to stay there, uh, but Curtin actually doesn't get a chance to stay there because he gets locked out of his room by Edward Everett, who takes the room over. But down that way will be York Street. That is modern day Route 30, which will take you out towards York, Pennsylvania, as well as Hanover, Pennsylvania. Out to the west is our first day's battlefield. That is the Chambersburg Pike. It'll take you out to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, the Franklin County seat, 23 miles to the west of us. And then to the south, we have Baltimore Street, which will take you to Baltimore. Uh, and that'll take you down to East Cemetery Hill, Little Round Top, Big Round Top, the Fields of Pickett's Charge, and those other places. So we have the Wills House out here. We have the McClellan House, which would have sat back here. This is the uh, Gettysburg Hotel. This would have been the McClellan uh, site. You would have uh, no relation to George. And then we would pan around here. We would have uh, some of the original buildings would have been down in that direction towards Chambersburg Street, would have had the bank across from us. The U.S. Christian Commission would have made their um, made their headquarters over there. I think that's in the Cobean store. And then, of course, we would have had the Adams uh, County Sentinel. I think that's the Sentinel that's down here. There's three newspapers. I'm trying to keep them in, intact. Um, and that is the area where um, William Seward the Secretary of State would have stayed. So we're going to take a, a walk here. Seward's one of our cabinet members who would have been here with Lincoln. Seward's known as the governor, a really interesting guy um, who uh, is kind of a homespun guy from New York. He was the governor in New York at one point. He would show up to your house. He would kick off his boots. He'd sit beside the fire. He'd spin a yarn, cursed extensively, uh, but was really a uh, person that people like to know. And Seward was potentially going to be the president of the United States before Abraham Lincoln came along. Uh, but Seward is a cabinet member with Lincoln. He's here. Uh, Lincoln, in fact, will go outside of the Wills House and have an impromptu speech that he will give. And one of the town members is actually going to interrupt him. And I'm going to interrupt my speech right now as we try to cross the street here for a moment. So we made it across here. We would have had uh, Lincoln pop his head out of the Wills House here. I'm going to spin us around so you can get a look at the Wills House. This is run by the National Park Service. You can come down here, visit this Park Service unit, head inside of the Wills House. But Lincoln would have come out here, given an impromptu speech. William Seward, who would have been over here in the Danner House, I think. I'm doing this without notes. Um, he is going to be uh, giving a little impromptu speech of his own. And eventually, so many people show up here that Abraham Lincoln to get back to his house has to tell his body servant or his bodyguard, uh, excuse me, a, a sergeant with the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry, a Bigham, as he tells him, I'm going to hold on to your coattails and you're going to push your way through and you're going to get me back to the house, which is the Will's house. Come on, Evan. Sarah? So as Chris mentioned, Gettysburg is full of thousands of people in uh, November 1863, and they've come for the dedication of the cemetery. And we're going to keep walking this direction. Um, and I like to introduce a concept that Gettysburg as a community, because remember, Gettysburg's a town before the battle comes here. And Gettysburg as a community has several different invasions, if we use that term a little bit loosely. So we have the military arrival, what we would generally think of with the term invasion. And that's, of course, going to happen in July 1863, as the Union Army of the Potomac, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, clash and battle for three days around and even through the very streets that we're walking on. We're walking up Baltimore Street here, or down Baltimore Street, pardon me, um, coming up on Middle Street in a little bit. So the armies come, and then when the battle's over, there's kind of this other invasion that comes next, and that's the medical invasion, because you have thousands of casualties, wounded soldiers, fallen soldiers who are left behind in the community, and the community needs to deal with this. They need to care for the living, who will hopefully be able to survive um, their injuries, and return to their families, but they also need to find a way to deal with these fallen soldiers. And that brings forward the idea of a national cemetery, um, which local citizens in Gettysburg um, begin working for, working toward. And then the establishment of that cemetery leads to kind of this third invasion of the community. This is a much more peaceful invasion, not a bloody invasion, but lots of people 
coming to this area, trying to find meaning, wanting to see the cemetery dedicated. One second, we're checking. We're going to stop here. We're, we're stopping stop here. here. All right. So um, keep, the, keep that in mind. You have a community that's had many, many people coming in, some um, for war reasons, some for humanitarian reasons, and some for commemorative or memorial mourning reasons. And so Gettysburg is going to have so many people coming. And this is part of the history of their town. And to some extent, that history continues. Today, we've got lots of people coming into the town of Gettysburg to remember what happened here during the Civil War, to remember the words that President Lincoln spoke on November 19th, 1863. I'm going to turn it back to Chris so he can let us know why we're stopping here. Uh, so we're just stopping here for a moment. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. Please share this with your friends and with your family. Uh, and, and really, we're trying to get the message out there about the trust as well as history in general. So we hope that you enjoy this. We hope that you'll share this with your friends and family. So as we walk along here, we're on Baltimore Street. We're heading south through Gettysburg. Behind me uh, is the Fauna Stock Building. The Fauna Stock Building is a wartime structure, and this is in fact where Oliver Otis Howard, the Union 11th Army Corps commander, will go up inside of this building and up to an observatory on the east side, or I'm sorry, the west side of the building. Uh, on the roof and he's able to somewhat see out to the first day's battlefield and he's also able to see to the north side which will turn into the first day's battlefield on the Gettysburg Plain. Now the Fauna Stock building is owned by the Fauna Stock brothers. Their father Samuel died in 1861 but the Fauna Stock brothers own a very substantial store here. This is where the um, not the Christian Commission, the Sanitary. Sanitary Commission will set up their headquarters while they're here. Thank you, Sarah. But it's a really interesting building. It's a private building today. We actually went up there a few years ago up onto the roof. So check out our video over on YouTube. Down the street would have had the office as well as the home of Moses McLean. Today it's a Christmas shop. And if you look up between the alley and up towards the roof, towards the gable, you'll actually see one of the nine shells that are still embedded in a building here in Gettysburg. We're just a little too far up the street to see that. Very historically speaking, this restaurant that's off to my left hand side on 48 Baltimore Street, this is Gary Edelman's former restaurant. Gary was a restaurateur before he was a historian with the American Battlefield Trust, and this is his restaurant that he used to own here in Gettysburg. Evan, I'm going to have you flip around real fast one more time. This is the Adams County Courthouse. It is created and uh, dedicated in 1859, the same year as the railroad station downtown. The, this uh, courthouse once sat on the square. They tore that one down, but used some of the bricks to build the 1859 courthouse. So we're gonna keep heading our way down Baltimore Street uh, just for a little bit, a little uh, farther. Um, anyone have anything they wanna add? Doug, I'm gonna give Doug our, Doug Ullman. He's grabbing a, a microphone. If you're wondering what we're wearing, these are our microphones here. Doug? Do that. All right, I've handed off my weapon to, to Sarah, who's going to take very good care of it. So as we make our way south through town, we're making our way up the gradual slope towards Cemetery Hill. Now, the streets are actually fairly open today because they're getting ready for the parade. But when you think of the battle, I want you to imagine this view on this street behind me choked with thousands of men making their way through the town on their way towards Cemetery Hill in the massive retreat from Gettysburg uh, up to Cemetery Hill. The, those troops, uh, the 1st and 11th Corps, are making their way up this road and the other roads towards Cemetery Hill, toward that Alamo of Gettysburg for, this, for what they hope will be a final stand, uh, or they hope that there's reinforcements up there. We can't really overemphasize the level of confusion that there would have been on these streets uh, in town at that time because there are just these first corps troops when they arrived in town uh, they didn't come through town they actually skirted around the town across the fields over to cemetery ridge so there they did not pause um, they did not know the streets that they were walking on they had no idea how to get they had no idea where they were going let alone how to get there 11th Corps troops have a little bit of a better idea because they have already passed through town on their way to fight north of town on the plain in places like Blockers, Knoll, etc. Uh, so they've got a bit of a better idea of where they're going as they make their way through town. But it is pandemonium. There are troops from two different corps coming in two different directions, all choking into the same street. And they all, all they want to do is just get away. One man in the first corps said everyone, everyone was running because they could not fly. That just gives you a sense of the panic that these men felt as they were running through the town trying to get to some semblance of safety, some semblance of uh, 
of security knowing that they've got other troops around them. And they're making their way up the hill through town, dodging through houses, through alleyways, men going into cellars, uh, and uh, Confederates trying to find their way through as well. They're trying to find these Yankees, trying to identify them, trying to capture whatever Yankees they could, trying to take whatever stuff they've got on them. Remember, this is a, a massive raid for the Confederate Army. They are trying to get supplies, so if they can take it off a live Yankee, that's as good as taking it off a farmer. There's, so there's, there's the pandemonium and confusion in these streets really can't be overestimated when we're talking about the fighting here on the afternoon and evening of July the 1st. And so um, one of the things I always like to think about is we, th we see the confusion and the chaos. Um, for us today in the modern world, it's not uncommon for us to think of military actions happening in residential areas, in, in cities. Um, that's what happened in the Second World War and in, even in, t in, in modern wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. But at the time of the Civil War, there were no um, procedures or very few tactics uh, that had been invented to deal with street fighting or to deal with house-to-house -house searches. So it really does begin to break things apart. Um, formations come undone, you know, units lose their cohesion. And so I always like to drive that home when we think about Lee's order to Ewell to take that hill if practicable. Ewell's corps is scattered all over this vicinity. He has no idea where some of his men are. They are, you know, rooting through alleyways and cellars in search of uh, Union troops and trying to, they, they, as, as a piece of or military organization, some of these regiments and brigades really don't exist. So how do you take a, an army that you can't get well in hand and order them to make an attack on a prepared position? I don't think it could be done. And so I think in that respect, Ewell gets a little bit too much criticism because he's got troops spread out all through over all throughout this town uh, and he can't really bring them in hand quick enough to get them into that fight. Chris. So we're going to turn around real fast. Uh, you'll see a Confederate band marching up here, but I'm not focused on them. I'm focused on the cannon that's out here that most people will never see. Evan, I'm going to bring you up over here. This is Penelope. She's a cannon who lives down here. She is not a Civil War cannon, but this sits out in front of the Democratic newspaper here in Gettysburg. The Penelope was used whenever there was a Democratic victory to be fired off. Well, in 1855, someone overloaded Penelope and she exploded. But out in front of the old newspaper here, the Democratic newspaper, they are going to put her into the sidewalk. And if you're walking along and you see the end of a cannon out here, that's Penelope. Swing around here. We're going to walk a few feet. Step up over here. So over here we have the, the uh, Adams County or the Gettysburg Library. This was the post office here in Gettysburg. And this was uh, actually at the time of the war, not here. This would have been the home of Dr. O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill is very important to us because he is one of the first men to go out and identify the Confederate dead. Uh, he is going to go out there and keep a log book that's actually in the Adams County Historical Society. We've seen it on some past live videos before. And he is going to help to start logging the Confederate dead on the battlefield. Most of those dead are not exhumed and taken away from the field until 1871 or 1872. And that work is done by two other men usually, and that is Rufus and Samuel Weaver, a father and son combination who helped to uh, exhume the bodies and send them south to places like Raleigh, uh, as well as Richmond, Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, and a few other places in the deeper south. So this would have been uh, Dr. O'Neill's house at the time. It becomes the Gettysburg Post Office. At the time of the Eisenhower presidency, Dwight David Eisenhower makes his only home, his only permanent home here in Gettysburg. He has a heart attack while he's out in Colorado. He comes back to his house here in Gettysburg and needs a federal building to work out of. And this, according to one of my friends, he told me it was the white temporary White House, as he put it, because they did some of the official business here in the Gettysburg Post Office, which is today the Gettysburg Library. Now, as we work our way up the street here, we'll have up the road just a little ways. Our next steeple up the road will be the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church is an important staple here in Gettysburg because that is where Abraham Lincoln, as well as the citizen hero John Burns will go and they will attend a democratic service held by the Ohio delegation while they're here on November 
1863. They'll go inside of there. John Burns will meet with the president, and Burns will actually fall asleep while he is inside of that church. Also, who attended this church in future years? Dwight David Eisenhower, his wife Mamie, as well as President, uh, Vice President, then President Richard Nixon. So this was a prominent church, this Presbyterian church here. Uh, it is actually not the original church that once sat down in this area. There are a few other churches. The Memorial Church over here was placed in the house of uh, Albertus McCreary was there at the time. Um, but this church was, its cornerstone was laid on the 25th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1888. And then down the street was a wartime structure that is St. Xavier's Church. Um, that church and that cupola will be used by Confederates to watch the uh, battle at Pickett's Charge, as well as the ending of the second day's battle on the south end of the field. And that is where Richard Yule will be in the uh, vicinity on the evening of July 2nd when he decides to start attacking places like Culp's Hill and East Cemetery Hill. So this area is just chock full of history down here. Let's take a walk down High Street. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. You're here in Gettysburg with us. We're covering Remembrance Day, and we are on what is called Baltimore Hill. This is along the Baltimore Street in Gettysburg. We're now walking down East High Street, um, and this would have been the basically epicenter in this area of the Gettysburg government. We had the Adams County Courthouse just down the street from us. We'll have the first large public school here in Gettysburg. We'll also have the jail. These buildings will all be used as hospitals. They'll also be used as lookout posts by some of the Confederates who are up here. And we have some great descriptions of Union soldiers who are captured by Confederates watching the attack on East Cemetery Hill. Uh, one man, Reuben Rush, who is with the 153rd Pennsylvania, watched from down in this area of the German Reformed Church, which is just down here. You can pan that way, Evan. I can walk and talk this way. See that steeple down there? That's the German Reformed Church, not the wartime structure. It was replaced after the war, but that is a the area of it. And Rush will watch out into the fields that would have been just uh, behind these buildings and watch the Louisiana Tigers as well as Isaac Avery's Tar Heels go forward on the evening of July 2nd, 1863. And Rush said something along the lines of men went forward and when the artillery shells came in, they came bounding down the hill like pumpkins rolling off of the back of a wagon is how he describes it. We have the jail over here, um, which is a really cool wartime structure. And then the first public school right over here, um, which is the large private building that we have over in this area. We have other history, World War I history up here. The, the German Reformed Church was used as a hospital for Camp Colt, which is the World War I um, uh, training camp up here run by David, Dwight David Eisenhower. That is going to be one of its pneumonia, or I'm sorry, one of its flu wards where people are taken off a base, placed there. They're also placed in Xavier Hall down at St. Francis Xavier Church and at other places around town as they start to quarantine. A very important place also will be Christ Lutheran Church, which is a long or I'm sorry, St. James's Lutheran Church, which is along York Street, just down the road from us. That is probably where the flu came into Gettysburg from a lady from California who came here to visit her husband. She brought it in here, and that is what, where it will start to spread from. But that church as well also played a role in the Battle of Gettysburg. There was a Confederate sharpshooter up in that cupola firing towards Cemetery Hill. So a bunch of Union soldiers decided to act like idiots and start jumping around and everything. They get this guy's attention and they fire a three inch ordnance rifle, a cannon downrange at this guy. They hit just above him in the cupola. And one of the eyewitnesses said he jumped down out of that cupola, down the ladder and out the front door and they didn't see him again. That was one way to get rid of a, a sharpshooter. But this area was known as Baltimore Hill. This would have been the front line, as Doug was talking about, between the sharpshooter action that will take place up on East Cemetery Hill, up around the gas station, which today, at the time was the Snyder's Wagon Hotel, down near the Rupp House, the um, other houses that were in that area, and then up here on the Confederate line. So you're at the very edge of town that the Confederates are going to hold, and then you go into a no man's land on the other side of this uh, large building. Anyone have anything to add? All right, so I just want nerd level for you for Gettysburg. If you're into the town, we encourage you to check out some of our uh, videos that we've done in the past with Tim Smith, who has 
by far the leading expert on Gettysburg civilians in this area. See our friend Andrew Dalton as well, both at the Adams County Historical Society, which is a great repository of all things Adams County, and that is uh, Gettysburg is the county seat of Adams County. So on behalf of Evan Portman behind the camera, Sarah K. Byerly, Doug Ullman, I'm Chris White. I want to thank you for watching. Join us at one o'clock on YouTube for our coverage of the Remembrance Day Parade. We're going to go get set up in our, our viewing stand with some of our friends, and we'll bring that to you live at 1 o'clock on YouTube, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for watching, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.